My swans, they've done it again. They've trolled us, hoodwinked us. They're playing with our hearts like a tiny violin. It was my understanding that everyone had heard. Heard what? Brian, don't! A well a bird, bird, bird. A bird, a well a well a body. A bird, a well a well a body. A bird, a well a well a body. A bird, a well a body. Well, about Franklin, he's in the team. After being categorically ruled out, he's in. This is the Swans Box Swans Cast Extra, the number one Sydney Swans fans weekend preview podcast. Yeah, I well, ruled him out on uh, on Monday. That's um, how unusual the injury was. And he had a scan again on uh, on Tuesday and uh, surprisingly showed um, that it was getting better really quickly. And then again Wednesday and got better and better during the course of the next couple of days to the point that he was able to train. In this week's episode, we will preview the Swans match against Fremantle, discuss Franklin's shock selection with Hanabry, what we're looking forward to, matchups, key points, team changes, give our predictions, and the weekend forecast. I'm Justin Mitchell, and with me is Heather Quinlan, Swans cast regular. Heather, talk about shaking this up at the selection table. Well, it's it was quite exciting, actually, to uh, see when the team selections came out. Uh, to see the Franklin name on there, obviously nobody was expecting it, and... Um, while I, I like to not hark back to the days, the dark old days of the 1990s when teams used to select ridiculous teams and uh, put ridiculous matchups down on the sheet and expect people to believe it and uh, and they never did, of course. Nothing ever sort of panned out the way it was um, selected on a Thursday night. I thought we'd pass those days, but maybe we haven't because we've got some pretty, <laughs> yeah. pretty interesting stuff going down here and I've got a bit of a conspiracy theory about it all. Have you got one about about what's, what's no, occurred? no, but I would love to hear your conspiracy theory. Well, my conspiracy theory is this I reckon John Longmire must be on the way out the door at the Swans. My big prediction is he must be getting the giant <laughs> boot from the Swans. How do I reckon I know this? Because if he had even, you know, a slight in with the medical team. Surely the medical team would have yep. advised him that Franklin actually wasn't that far away, as opposed to him coming yep. out on the media, out in the media on a Monday, categorically ruling him out on a Monday. Yes. For the Saturday game, and basically in, uh, insinuating that he would miss at least another couple of weeks. So clearly. Old horse has been kept totally in the dark <laughs> by the medical team. If I was horse, I'd be a bit worried yep. about my job at the end of the year. That's my conspiracy theory. I'm a bit worried theory. about the medical team. <laughs> oh, look, uh, if we had a uh, Thursday rant off, I think that would be the perfect one. But, yeah, geez, um, treatment of uh, injuries and diagnosis and returning timelines and everything's just been a bit all over the place. Like Sam Reed is still listed as six to eight, despite the fact that the uh, Swans Twitter feed today said that he's still four to five. God, it's, he's been the longest six to eight week I've ever seen in my life. But yeah, it's all over the shop at the moment. But uh, look, uh, let's kick straight on to, into it, into uh, top of the agenda for today's show. Clarko on the weekend, he uh, went a bit crazy, Heather. Do you think he went a bit crazy? Yep. Alistair Clarkson has been known to slam his hand through the odd um, coach's box wall. Um, <laughs> yep. And I think he had one of those, metaphorically speaking, because he um, he lost the plot when the Swans uh, beat Hawthorne uh, the other night and had yes. a bit of a whinge about blocking rules. And there was much hilarity played out Um <laughs> among Sydney Sydney supporters, of course, because the hypocrisy of um, Alistair coming out with that kind of line when we all know that uh, blocking and um, doing all manner of interesting things to win a free kick has just been part of the Hawthorne Arsenal for the last sort of, you know, six, yeah. seven years, really. It really has. They were the team that really um, founded that and started playing with that style, going all the way back to pretty much 2008 or even earlier. But the um, what I found almost comical about the whole situation was the fact that uh, with these discussions, the umpires, or at least the CEO, has given guidance to the umpires to go back to basics. I couldn't really believe what was actually published on Monday was that the umpires have been instructed to watch the contest after disposal, where the ball was and then watch the contest where the ball is traveling to instead of watching the ball i just couldn't believe that because when i was umpiring that was the fundamental that you learned and were taught that you had to watch the contest and the next contest you don't watch the ball in the air you don't watch the crowd you don't have a chat to the players while the game is still in play yeah it does seem a bit um 
quite basic, doesn't it? But my understanding it does. my understanding is that this is something that had been brought up earlier in the season when there were potentially another uh, there was another similar kind of issue arose with another team, I guess. But um, yeah. There was a bit of a hiatus for a while, and then after the Swans game, obviously, uh, Clarko sought out specifically Gillam McLaughlin to have a chat over a coffee and bend his ear about yep. blocking. And then magically, <laughs> magically, uh, and coincidentally, this uh, edict has come down to the to the umpires to be effectively be more on the ball with how they police this particular. Yep. Uh, thing now, blocking is essentially illegal, so we're all happy with that. But it does have to be um, umpired um, consistently every week. It's not there. I would say blocking is the least of the issues as far as umpiring consistency goes. I know Matt Stevick gets a lot of finals and a lot of grand finals, but if you're watching from a bird's eye perspective, his consistency isn't very good at the moment. He's all over the shop, and some of the umpires. Um, uh, I can't remember the, the chap who was involved in the Carlton and Essendon game on Saturday afternoon last week. He had a deplorable first quarter. He gave away a 50 against um, Carlton when it was actually an Essendon player that infringed. He paid the free kick the wrong way and uh, he paid marks off other people's hands. It was quite an embarrassing performance to watch that sort of thing. I'm all for the umpires resetting the basics. Absolutely, 100% there. I think there's more issues than just blocking. So that that's my perspective on that. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I think you'll find that that umpire that you were talking about from that game is probably umpiring the Essendon under-9s this weekend. So I'm not sure we have to worry about him. <laughs> um, yes. And also, I might, I might add here, and you, you'll probably never hear me say this again, but um, I think Ray Chamberlain is probably uh, one of the um, better performing umpires at the moment, yes. if you can believe that. agree. I'm actually looking forward to him coming in. I've wanted him to umpire Swans games for a while. I've been talking off air with a couple of people about the umpiring in general, and there is a bit of discussion about trying to do a uh, special podcast about umpiring and where it's at. Uh, just I'll give you a quick thought on Ray Chamberlain, and we'll move on to the next thing. I think he's great. I think he's probably the best umpire in the AFL at the moment. But from my experience as an umpire, they aren't going to give him big games because he's a bit eccentric. He can He's unpredictable. He's a little bit inconsistent as far as the way he acts, and you don't know what you're going to get with him. I think that's the exciting part with him because he's happy to chat to players and he's happy to be a bit, uh, I wouldn't say fruity, but excitable and cheery and happy when everyone else looks a bit, <laughs> bit serious, a bit wooden and a bit robot -y. But you need that. You need characters. And he's a great character and he's a great decision maker and he's a great umpire. He's inconsistent, uh, and the umpire don't know what they're going to get with him. But mm. umpiring, I could chat about it for hours, and we're going to be stuck here with a very long podcast if I do. So I think we just get straight into the team, uh, into the team changes, Heather. Yes. Would you like to kick us off with the first team change? Well, the first change that we have, of <laughs> course, is that uh, Lance Franklin in. Uh, and look, we've got Dean Towers going out. I, I picked Dan Robinson to go out, um, but Dean Towers has made way for Franklin. And um, uh, I mean, Towers is a bit unlucky, but look, when it, when you're faced with a $10 million man, there's probably no surprises there. I'll be very interested <laughs> yeah. to see. And of course, Dan Hanabry is in as well. And we had we had felt that that was the case because he's been knocking on the door now for uh, probably a week and a half. Yeah. Um, my just my only comment, I guess, about the Frank, other than what I've already said and my um, radical conspiracy theories, is that I really hope that Franklin um, is actually physically in good shape enough to make an impact in this game. Because if he can't, yeah. if he is, if he actually comes in and does diddly squat, or uh, certainly yeah. his version of not much, um, I'm yeah. not sure that that's going to benefit the team because one of the no. things that we're going to talk about is the need for, the, for Sydney to score and hopefully score big. Yep. And if he is restricted in any way or not quite 100%, I'm not sure how he's, he's going to be of benefit. But uh, look, let's think positive here and I'm sure that you know probably there might even be an extra 5,000 turn up to the match, so let's hope for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's an interesting one, and you're right, if he doesn't perform or if he looks restricted or if there's any issues whatsoever, it's going to reflect really poorly on the coaches, but also on the medical team who are managing him and giving the coaches the information that they need to make selections. Uh, if he's running around and looks like he can't break into a, into a sprint, forget it. I mean, what's he going to do? Just sit it full forward and hope to kick a bag? 
uh, he'll get defeated or overcome by his opponent pretty quickly, I would think. But the other in is the one we always expected. It was pretty much him at the start of the week, and that's Hannah Breen. He's coming for Dan Robinson. Now, we've spoken about this offline. Dan Robinson was the obvious choice to come out. Obviously, we're a little bit surprised by Dean Towers, but I'm glad that Hannah Breen's back because it's going to free up players like Jack, like Heaney, uh, Mills even to some extent, and even uh, Jones and Hewitt to do a little bit more of what they're doing. Same with Parker. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Justin. Um, again, though, without wanting to sound like a broken record, um, Hanabry has not been playing to his usual standard uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> he has suffered from injuries a bit over the last couple of years. I would yeah. like to see him actually be able to come out and have some sort of impact, even if it's well, only for half or three quarters of a game. But we'd like to see a bit of dash, a bit of run from him and a, a bit of his great ball use rather than really some of the quite pedestrian um, stuff that we've seen from him when he's clearly been restricted in his running. So, again, yeah. if, you're going to, if you're going to select him, let's see the, the great Dan Hanabry that we know and love. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. His last couple of games are very, very flat, and it, and it was very much like Kieran Jack last year. So I'm, I'm glad the club's actually taken a bit more of a pragmatic uh, and conservative approach with him. And that's something that I know the two of us were discussing even on the last couple of podcasts was the fact that they shouldn't have brought him back so quickly because he just didn't look fit. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, look, the, the preview of the match actually has um, pretty much changed on the spot, I think. We had, uh, for those that listen, um, so basically we actually prepare a lot of this content beforehand um, on the proviso that uh, team selection, so they don't really uh, get surprised or do any serious shakeups. But uh, as far as the Franklin call goes, this is about as big as a shakeup as I've seen for quite a few years. Now, their history between the sides is you'd think it would be a bit Sydney lopsided. Uh, certainly in the AFL article today, it suggested as much. Uh, they've gone a lot further back in history than I have, uh, which I would say is probably not really relevant. They're far, as far back as I've gone is just 2010. And um, look, obviously the Swans, you know, they spanked them last time they played Heather, kicked 8-2 in the first quarter. Um, they never headed at half time. They were 13-6 to 1-3, and it was just pretty much pedestrian. They just walked out the result mm -hmm. after that point. And we also had 12 goal kickers. So, like, last time I thought it was really good. But, uh, look, some of the head-to-head -head is the fact that the Swans won three of the last five. They've also won three of the last six at the SEG since 2010, but there is a draw. Uh, they have won six from 12 with one draw between the sides since 2010, so they're basically 6-5. Uh, and look, the um, interesting one is the fact that uh, Sydney hasn't beat Fremantle under lights since 2008. Heather, have you got any more to add to that? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that's a pretty comprehensive wrap-up. I, I guess I'd just make the point that in that match last year when the Swans went obviously completely berserk, um, yep. Franklin Franklin did play. I'm not I'm not sure how many he kicked. We didn't actually research that because I think, he thought he wasn't um... playing. Three or four from the top of my head. It wasn't a bag. He didn't kick a bag. But we had yeah, 12 yeah. goal kickers. Yeah. And look, we would like, you'd like to think that um, having Franklin in the team would actually uh, add to the Sydney's capacity to, um, you know, kick a winning score. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, I did watch that draw and it was horrific. So yeah. please uh, let's <laughs> let's avoid that at, at, at all at all costs. Is there anything yeah, worse than a draw? It. I'm not I'm not sure that there is. Yep. So let, let let's move right along. Um, I guess now to the matchups. Yeah. Uh, look, could you uh, please kick it off with your first matchup, Heather? Well, my first matchup is, um, and can I just say, let's give Frio the heave ho this weekend. I reckon. <laughs> Yeah. Big sinker, big sinkers, Callum Sinclair versus Big Sandy. I reckon that's yep. going to be a top contest. And the reason why I'm saying this is because obviously Sandlands is the is the biggest ruckman going around, uh, 211 centimetres, and sinkers only 200. But here's the deal: this season, Callum Sinclair has been having a really good year. He, in terms yeah. of fantasy points, if that's your thing, he's on 99, 99 and a half versus yep. Sandy's 82. So in terms of his effectiveness around the around the ground, he is proving that he is up to um, AFL standard and good on oh, him. Oh, no so question. If we're, and if we're looking at the head-to-heads here, um, this season we're talking versus Sandilands, more inside 50s, more tackles, more disposals, 
Uh, more contested possessions, and look on the downside, I guess more turnovers, but it's not massive. Yep. It's only one extra per per game. Now, Sandy's having 41.6 hitouts average per game compared with Sinclair's 35, but I would put it to you that Sinclair is not really a specialist ruckman, although he's been made into no. one, and and so. So there's not actually a huge discrepancy there, and <clears throat> I really like this matchup. And I just think with Sinclair being in form, I, th I think that um, it's going to negate Sanderlin's uh, impact on the game. That that's my take on it. I completely agree. I think it's going to be an important matchup, but Sinclair's form has pretty much allowed him to, uh, I guess, have more of an impact around the ground. And it was a really interesting matchup against McAvoy last week because McAvoy had him nudge a little bit, just a tiny bit in the AFL fantasy and also dream team in that, like just like a slither. And he had, I think, four more disposals, but they were pretty much neck to neck. And Sinclair actually finished with more hit outs. So that was one thing I couldn't actually believe is the fact that he's actually having far more impact in the ruck this year than he was last year. Probably three or four fold of an impact. So... I think uh, athletic-wise, he's definitely fitter, faster, and stronger than he was last year. So I reckon he stands a good chance on this one, Heather. Yeah, absolutely. And so what, what's your um, first match up there, Justin? Well, we don't really know if he's going to play or not. But even if he does, I think we still have to go with this plan. And that's George Hewitt, the number one shutdown player on Nat Fife. And uh, look, as far as superstars go, Nat Fife is in red, ripping form, red hot Potential Brownlow favourite is uh, what a few are banding around, and he has been sensational for Fremantle and the reason why they're 4-4. Four and four. So it's uh, up to Hewitt. It is beholden on him to shut Fife down. And what's the situation with Nat Fife? Why is he um, sort of not automatically into this game? Well, I'm not too sure uh, the specifics, but uh, the rumour or scuttlebutt is that uh, he did pick up a bit of an injury uh, during the week and he did travel with the team, but it's kind of looking a bit like the Hanbury situation where a late fitness test will rule him in or out. So there is some rumour and chatter that he might be out. But hey, it could just be uh, in the innuendo and rumour and locker room talk, given that Franklin was selected, so you really don't know. No, you don't. So let's assume that he's going to play and he's going to be dangerous because we yeah. all respect we all respect Fifey, I think it's fair to say. Absolutely. Now, Heather, which is your second matchup of the night? Well, this one is a little bit controversial because we're not we're really not sure who the two hundred gamer Nick Smith is is going to be playing on, and there he he could he could actually match up on really realistically probably three or four different Frio players. Yeah. But I must just put my hand up here and say Nick Smith is a personal favourite in my household. He's playing his 200th <laughs> game this weekend. We, a special shout out to Nick Smith. We love Smooch. Um, he's pretty handsome <laughs> as well as being as well as being a very good player. And I Isn't he, he, uh, he Kate's favourite as well? He's my daughter Kate's absolute favourite. She's been in love with him since she was about 15, so she's now 20. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so Lock yes, her up, keep him away. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We, we have a special affinity with Nick Smith in, in my household. And look, I reckon he might spend some time on um, Hayden Ballantyne. And um, Justin, I know that you believe that Ballantyne is well past his best. Actually, so do I. But at times, he can be quite annoying in many ways, but quite <laughs> annoying in the respect that he can, um, you know, he can sneak in um, the odd goal. He is a bit of a sneak, really, yeah. full stop, all over the ground. He's got that sort of dangerous ability just to bob up and cause a bit of havoc. And in the past, he's been an absolute thorn in Sydney's side. He yep. caused a virtual riot at the SCG a few years ago and primarily caused the Sydney Swans to lose that game because they were completely distracted by Hayden Ballantyne and forgot to win the game. <laughs> so, so... Um, so I reckon Nick Smith's going to do a bit of a job on him. I would say that Ballantyne hasn't been in superb form. Um, he's averaging 1.1 goals this year per game. Yeah. Um, 4.9 4, 4 score involvements. That's, that's okay. 11.6 disposals. Mm, you could be doing better. I'd, yeah. I'd, uh, back, I'd be backing Nick Smith to take the money in this because he's very reliable. There's very few peaks and troughs with Nick Smith's game. It's, it's pretty, pretty steady. So... Uh, I'm backing uh, Nick Smith to shut down uh, Hayden Ballantyne and hopefully shut his mouth as well. 
Yeah, absolutely agree. And look, uh, Michael Walters is in as well. So his, so is Hill. So you're right. There's probably three, if not four players he could go to. And um, look, my last matchup is obviously the head to head in the midfield. It's got to be Luke Parker on Lockie Neal. Uh, mm. Lockie Neal has been in good form, really, really good form. He's winning a lot of the ball and he's leading that midfield with five. And Luke Barker, he's been a bit up and down, uh, a bit mixed, I would say, throughout the season. But uh, look, he's returned to form, and let's hope that is uh, an actual return to form, not a little tiny purple patch in the middle of a uh, tick-up storm. And uh, look, we need Luke Parker at his best, but uh, we need to shut down Lockie Neal or at least negate him. Oh, 100%. Isn't he averaging? He's averaging virtually 32 disposals a match. Oh, and, big numbers, um, Frank, big numbers. Big, big, big numbers. And I think, in fact, he he was lead, leading that um, um, statistical category at the end of last season for Fremantle. Yeah. So he, he is quite prolific and really one of their very quality players. And, geez, I hope Luke Parker has a red patch and not a purple patch, though, <laughs> Justin. <laughs> hey, if he's red hot at the end of the match, he can get my five and the coach's ten. <laughs> but, look, uh, Lockie Neal's definitely been factoring in the coach's votes. Uh, he'll probably be top, uh, top three or top four on their best and fairest at this point. I would be surprised if he isn't because he has been a very good player for them for an extended period of time. But look, um, I guess for a couple more facts before we move on to our key points. Uh, so the Swan small forward line of Hayward, Ronk, Papley, Jack, Parker and Florent have kicked 44 goals between them. Uh, Franklin's kicked 18. So look, uh, the, the match against Hawthorne did not have a spread of goal kickers. There was actually three for the Swans. It was Parker 2, Hayward 3, Ronk 7. And uh, Hawthorne had four. So we need a, need a little bit of a spread there, but I like what the Smalls are doing. Uh, the average for and against for both teams are pretty much about the same. Uh, and the Swans have only lost two away games since round seven, 2017, but nine of 16 at home since the start of 2017. So we really need to um, fix things up there, Heather. <laughs> One hundred percent. And if I could just actually move into my first key point of the actual yep. ma- uh, of the actual um, uh, upcoming match for the weekend, um, <clears throat> yeah, we look. We really need um, to find a way to score a bit more. Um, we need. We're looking for a few more rocks uh, to cut Bob up, and you know, at least kick two or three, maybe six or seven, would be very terribly <laughs> yeah. nice. But look. You mentioned before that um, uh, this game last year that Fremantle we absolutely smashed by more than a hundred points. We actually the winning margin was more than a hundred points. I think this year, <laughs> we this year this weekend we actually need to score one hundred points. Yeah. I don't. I think you'll find that we haven't often achieved that thus far over the first seven rounds. That we might have done it once or twice, but certainly we've had some pretty low scoring kind of. Affairs and and um, it's look. This is just an opportunity, I think, uh, particularly with Franklin back, is to actually kick a bit of a score, and and really just um, uh, find a way because uh, yeah, it, it's it's hasn't been good in in at their home games last last. Well, this season, I think we're one of three, yeah. aren't we? One from four, one from four. One from four this season. We were mm. one from yep. um, six last year. So it's not the end of the world. It's not total panic stations. But if we're losing this game, I think finals is might be a little bit out of the question or at least top four. We can't be losing this and finishing top four. I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible. No. Yeah. No. All right. What, have you, what sort of key point are you looking at? Look, uh, I kind of touched on this briefly before with Hewitt, um, but I just like to sort of go over the fact that fat, um, n- not Fat Knife, n- Nat Fife is playing. <laughs> bit of a, another alliteration. I'm getting about one an episode and sounding a bit bit ditzy here, but uh, Nat Fife is playing career best football at the moment, and the uh, Swans either have to uh, shut him down or negate him. He has been uh, red hot, and um, look, if the Swans. Even just go head to head and block up the runners. Uh, someone like a Lockie Neal or the uh, Hill brothers, if they're both playing. I know Stephen Hills in if they can, and especially Michael Walters, if they can shut them down on the outside. Even if he picks up thirty and thirteen or fourteen contested, it's not going to matter too much. They just need to quell him or block his influence. That that is key to victory, in my opinion. And Heather, what is your second key point to victory? Well, <clears throat> I was having a look at the ladder. And the latter is telling us that the Sydney Swans are seventh 
at the moment. That's not so bad. Um, we've obviously won um, five matches out of our eight, which isn't too bad. There's a bunch of teams in exactly the same position. The reason we're seventh is that our percentage is essentially poor. Um, yeah. It's not, not that much over 100, but I think it's about 103% or something. It's not great, or 106%. It's not great. <clears throat> and in my opinion... Um, this is what gets teams into trouble towards the end of the season. You may remember yeah, last great. year that, uh, that, that the Demons um, uh, had a poor percentage. They were in a position where they could have made it into the top eight, but then they managed to lose the game just by like, not much, but their poor percentage. Yeah. Remember, they slipped, slipped out of the eight right at the death. It must have been very painful for all the players who were busting their backsides, but the reality is that some of their terrible results early in the season came back to bite them on the backside they later really on and I think that this is an opportunity for the Swans to yep. go you know what we can get, work up our percentage here we can improve it and really just make a bit of ground on some of those other teams that we're sort of caught up in what do you think I think I agree I think you could also apply that to the Swans last year um, they really suffered from their start Obviously, winning 14 from 16 helped them get into a position to actually make the top four. But in the end, um, they were too far off percentage-wise from Port Adelaide to be able to get in. Um, Richmond um, was ahead. So, y you never know. Like, the percentage is obviously critical at the tail end of the season. And it's 2016. We snuck in and we finished first based on percentage. We actually needed results to go our way. But that's just how important percentage is. So... In the end, it really makes a difference, I think, between a uh, potentially top six, top four, or even top eight, and where you actually yeah. finish and what opportunity you yeah, get for well, finals. I, I think so too, and I think that – sorry to interrupt there – and I think that the Cats, um, Geelong at the moment, they're also on 20 points. I think their percentage is 123, and yep. they could be in third. Uh, so I think that that just – I mean, it's still early in the season, but I just wouldn't want to see the Swans um, – yeah, just being pushed out of either top four or, God forbid, out of the finals altogether yeah. based on a poor percentage. And I think this is—I think that, that, that this weekend provides a great opportunity. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but um, they're not going to be an easy team to beat, I think. So it's going to be a risky game. And look, uh, for my second one, uh, mm -hmm. we've talked about this offline and I think we both agree with this one, but the Swans simply have to find a way to score at home. Fremantle, they are going to fly back and they're going to defend 18 behind the ball because it's worked for every other team. North Melbourne did it. Uh, Adelaide did it. Port Adelaide did it. Uh, it's it's worked. So they need to find a way to score even with 18 players in their defensive or for the Swans, their forward 50. So maybe having... Franklin back will take the pressure off Hayward, who's been sensational in his absence. It might give Ben Rock more opportunity. Kieran Jack as well. Uh, maybe Luke Park will keep kicking goals, one or two a game. So there's opportunity for other players to contribute. We just can't score 60 or 70 again for the fourth time this season at home. It's just not going to work. Not going to get close to winning for kicking 60 points. No, I totally agree with you. But I think it's... Um, we may be on the same page here, but I, I think that the, the best way... Um, to really, well, give a, give a team second thoughts about doing that is actually to just um, play with some flair, play with some um, an attack in an attacking frame of mind, take opportunities to bust your way through the middle, um, break a few lines, bomb the ball in, you know, get a few people busting their yep. lungs to run run back towards goal. You know, you break through the lines a few times, and you you, you score a few easy ones with some. You know, was that easy? I mean, you you work hard to make yeah, those yep. opportunities to bust the lines. Maybe play with a little bit of dare, a bit of flair, a bit of attack. You know, up the middle instead of yep. you know the, the safe and easy route along the along the boundary line. Bust them open a few times, and they won't be so keen to flood back eighteen because they'll get broken open. So uh, that's that yeah. would be um that would be my thought. It really depends whether or not they go a uh, seven-player defence. And if the Swans want to man them up and have a seven-player forward line and then all of a sudden that space is choked up. One of the things that the SCG has over other fields is the fact that it's wide. So the Swans can exploit that, trap them out wide, and then just go uh, inside quickly and fast and long as well, long and direct. That would be probably my hope. I don't know if they'll do it, but that's what I'd like the Swans to do. Yeah, same same here. And look, I would say that since the Swans have acquired a bit of pace through the middle, I think that they're, they're kind of working out how to play their own home ground. Yep. 
properly. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. And I, I do have enormous respect for, for Fremantle and um, uh, for their coaching staff there. So I'm sure that they'll uh, they'll they'll try and, and beat Sydney at their own game. But um, look, I've just got the feeling that this is the weekend when the Swans are finally going to take their home ground opportunity, Justin. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, re- they really have to. Now let's uh, let's look at the predictions from last week. So I'll just quickly go through them. Uh, I think we actually did quite well. So Stephen, his first prediction was Kennedy will win the centre clearance count. Uh, he certainly did. My first one was smashing Sinclair. Sinclair to rack up 18 disposals and five clearances. Didn't quite. He was four off and I think one or two clearances off. Stephen's second prediction was Ruffhead will kick four goals. Uh, he only kicked one, and that was the first minute of the third quarter. And the last one was Young Stars lead the way. Six goals between Hayward, Papley, Ronk, and McCartan. I think I nailed that one on the head about uh, Justin, you're a, two-thirds you're of the genius. way into the second quarter. <laughs> Not even <laughs> half time. six goals. Thank you, Ronk. I actually didn't have Ronk in it to begin with, so... <laughs> But uh, I was very, very happy with that one. Now, Heather, um, would you please kick us off with your first prediction this week? Yes, I got it. my prediction is uh, Josh Kennedy, uh, our esteemed captain, to have a 30-plus disposal game and to kick a goal, at least, at least one goal. That's and a good game. The, my, the, re- the reason for my prediction is that I just feel that Kennedy is a good man. He was well held the other night. He really didn't have a massive influence. Um, I think he's going to bust out of that and I think he is in fact going to um, uh, assert his influence over the game and yeah. I think that uh, there'll be a fair bit of attention given to Fife and Neil and I think that'll, hmm, I'm liking to think that he is going to actually yeah. going to, he's actually going to um, really stand up because I think he's a proud man and I, I'm not sure that he's, yeah. he's been overly happy with his inconsistent form this season. Well, um, even Longmire said that Howe went to him and did a really good shutdown job. So I think without Hanabry being there in the middle, he's getting a lot more attention than he normally would. And same with Parker. So I think that form, that inconsistent form, is probably attributed to the defensive tactics of the other coaches. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And what's your first prediction? Well, I'm going Parker beast mode. He's going to pick up 10 clearances, 10 contested possessions, and 7 tackles. Well, at least... The minimums of each. I didn't go the uh, triple-double. That's more of a basketball kind of term, but at least uh, 10, 10, and 7. That's what I think he's going to do. Wow. I'd like to see that. And I'm, I'm going to the game, Justin, so I'm yep. looking forward to seeing that in apps in person. <laughs> well, hopefully they win for you this time because how how far is it? How long do you have to drive? Uh, it's five and a half hours from where I Ouch. live to the SCG, and that's with a very short stop um, for a cup of tea oh, and God. a quick visit. So uh, <laughs> otherwise, yeah. it's a bit longer. And of course, if the Sydney traffic is anything, you know, if it turns ugly, it could be more like six hours. But yeah, it's a long way yep. to go for a game of footy, but I love to do it for my Sydney Swans. All right. Now, Heather, what is your second prediction? Well, this is a pretty obvious one. And look, uh, I suspect that this is, in fact, um, probably some people would even consider it to be not a prediction, but in actual fact, just a standard sort of performance. <laughs> but my prediction is that Hayden Ballantyne will do a lot of yapping to the opposition and basically try and rile up the Swans every which way that he yep. possibly can because he would feel that it's worked in the past and if he can distract them enough, it may be enough to put them off their game. So my tip is that we'll see a bit of action from Hayden Ballantyne yeah. on Saturday night. A bit of a uh, vis-a-vis Stevie Baker kind of performance, you think? Something like that. Something yeah. like that, only with only with less class. <laughs> well, it depends on what perspective. Perspective always counts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, dear. What about you, Justin? Okay, this is a big one. And um, look... On a really good night for Nick Smith, he's playing his 200th match, for those that don't know. And the other important one is the fact that Kennedy is actually playing his 200th match for the Swans. So he's played 200-odd. Uh, so it's pretty big milestones for both players. I'm going with rookies lead the way. Three rookies to receive coaches' votes. So there are quite a few on the team. Half the team is rookies, so I think I'm uh, in with a chance on that one. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. I, I, I really like that. That's, um, yeah, that, I'd love to see it. Love to see the young guys sort of do well. 
Well, we've got Smith, Rampy, and Grundy are rookies from defense. Um, Lloyd, I can't remember if he's a rookie. I think Lloyd was a rookie. Uh, obviously, Ronk is a rookie. Kieran Jack's a rookie. Uh, the list just goes on. I could be here for the next two minutes rattling them off. But uh, look, uh, the weekend forecast now, Heather. Um, do you have a sure thing for the weekend ahead? I have a sure thing. The Swans will beat Fremantle by at least five goals. And I'm, Ooh, thinking, like more like, I'm thinking more like seven or eight, but I'm, I've, I've gone conservative. Beat them by five goals or more. Ideally, I'd like 70 or 80 points, but yeah, five goals, I like it. Yeah, absolutely. And what's, uh, I think you might have the most at stake. I do. I think the most at stake for the Swans going ahead this week is the home ground support. I'm not quite sure the fans will keep turning up on cold, wintry, wet nights if the Swans aren't winning games or at least performing well. And I guess that goes back to what I'm saying with the Swans. They just can't can't keep scoring 60 or 70 points a match. So, yeah, that's my most at stake, Heather. Yeah, and I think you're right in two respects there because if... um uh, Fremantle do as we expect and, and try and get 18 behind the ball it, it, potentially there is the potential there for it to be a bit of an ugly game and yeah. uh, and we have seen already a couple of those this season so I think it's incumbent on the Swans and the coaching staff to come up with the quote unquote plan B for that <laughs> yeah. uh, and really, and really come to play because I think this is an opportunity for them, for the Swans to, yeah, come up with a sort of, a, you know, improve their winning percentage. And uh, you're right, people like potentially people like me who drive a long way to get to a game will be turned off um, in future games if they feel like not only are they going to lose, but it's going to be really ugly. Yeah, look, the game plan that they're playing at the moment has changed. It's very different to what it was two years ago, and it's clearly working away. There is no question. It's just that the home form hasn't followed, so uh, they need to win. Now, Heather, your doomsday scenario, I believe you have one? Yes, I do. It's actually not Swans related. Um, People might be aware that uh, for the second year now, um, two Australian AFL teams are going to be playing off in China, uh, AFL trying to obviously expand its um, its audience and its reach uh, worldwide, uh, an interesting and brave concept and I, I think it's fantastic. Unfortunately, um, the two teams involved, Gold Coast and Port, Port have been the superior yeah. team to the Gold Coast really quite consistently now, well, for some years. Gold Coast have, have had a, their fair share of problems and last year, Port beat Gold Coast in that China match. Um, well, I can't remember the score, but look, I know that it was, was I turned off. About 120 I, points or something silly like that. I think, I think I think I turned off in the second quarter because it was really boring because they were winning yeah. by so much. So my doomsday scenario is that the Gold Coast, who are not going well again this year, uh, get absolutely slaughtered by Port again, which yep. frankly, people in Australia won't watch that kind of thing. So I just can't imagine how Chinese people would want to watch it. Yeah, look, the AFL's actually put out figures that they expect it to be the most watched game this year. I don't know where they're coming up with these predictions or forecasts from because no one wants to watch Gold Coast and Port Adelaide. Um, I think last year it was more like, a, oh, let's see what they're doing in China. And about five minutes in, it's like, okay, then I think I'm going to watch Home and Away or something else. It was a truly dreadful spectacle, unfortunately. Yeah, it was, and I think that too, because they're having to use um, sporting grounds that aren't probably, you know, ideally suited to AFL. So they're having to make some compromises in that respect. And I've got every, um, I, I really respect the clubs and the AFL for getting involved in, in, you know, an initiative like it. It, it that's not really the issue. I guess it's more the fact that, unfortunately, uh, you know, for reasons that potentially only the clubs themselves and the AFL know the two teams that are involved at the moment are there's a bit of a disparity between their performances and I think that they would probably be better served with two more evenly matched sides but we don't know what sort of contractual arrangements have been put in place so I just I reckon an Adelaide Derby over there would be sensational you'd definitely tune in for that Oh, 100%. I can only hope that the Gold Coast come to play and that they, they perform well 
and that uh, it's it's a competitive match. That's what that's sort of what I'm hoping for because really if they yeah. don't, I just can't I just can't see how this experiment is going to go on for a hell of a lot longer yep. if we see a repeat of what we saw last year. Well, it's a bit similar to what happened over in New Zealand when Sydney gave St Kilda an absolute whacking the second time around and I think people over there just didn't turn up and there was no interest. So it's definitely a very good doomsday scenario. If they don't perform, there's not going to be any interest. Look, Heather... It has been fantastic having you on again. Thank you so much for coming on the Swans Cast Extra Weekend Preview Show. Thanks for inviting me, Justin. It's always a really good chat, and I hope everyone uh, tunes in or turns up for the game on Saturday night. (laughs) Absolutely. Get to the ground. It's um, Red Sydney Week or something like that, so make sure you get to the ground, wear your red, cheer the Swans, and uh, let's hope that they win. Now, look, as always, you can find us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter with the tag The Swans Blog, and you can always get in touch with us using the hashtags SwansCast for Monday shows and SwanCast extra for Thursday shows. We'll be back on Monday. We're actually going to have AFL journalist Adam Curley with us for a quick 10 minute update. So stay tuned for that. We're really excited for it. And until next time, go Swans. Go Swans. Go Swans.